Welcome everyone to tonight's book talk with me, Yusuf. My name is Suzanne Inemi, I'm marketing manager at AUC Press and Bookstores. I'm excited to be presenting this book, um, but let me first introduce you to Nia. Um, Nia Yusuf uh, is the author of the Kaidun History and Guide, the revised edition was published in 2008 by AUC Press. He's also the translator of after the Nobel Prize 1989-1994 and he also translated other fiction by Yusuf Idris, Yusuf Abraina, Demel Rutani and he has been living in the Batu village of Tunis in Kayum on and off for 42 years, he told us. Yeah. So he knows it more than most Egyptians like myself would ever know. Okay. Tonight's event is going to be for one hour almost. We're going to start with a presentation by Neil, and then we're going to open the floor for some Q&A. I'm sure you might want to ask, ask him some questions about pottery and Kayum. But I've had the pleasure to work with Neil for many years at the AUC Press, where he served the role of the director of the editorial programs for many years. And I also had the pleasure to welcome him tonight for his book talk. Thank you. to Fayoum. Uh, some of you are familiar with it, many of you have been there, visited, um, but um, I, uh, as Susan says, I've been living not actually in the Tunis village for 42 years off and on, but Fayoum off and on, because I lived in the city first and then uh, when I was teaching English there uh, from 1979. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, often on the last uh, 18 or so years I've been in Tunis village. So here uh, is a quick sort of brief uh, uh, display of Fayoum pottery. There are three villages, three sites we're going to talk about. Um, and there's, there are examples from all three in this picture here. So if I can get this thing to work. These large pots, left and right, are from Komoshim, which is uh, the place where they make the special you know, garden pottery, big jardiniers and so on. These uh, rock pots in the middle, these are water pots basically from Nazla. Um, and then most of the ones, all the ones with glazes, are from Tunis village. The um, great lotus plant of Egypt. You have the, the stem of the lotus, the, the flower of the delta, and the, the fame is the bud of the lotus plant <coughs> off to the left there. That's where it is. So it's not that far from Cairo. It's a couple of hours drive, well, depending where you're going in fame. It's quite a large area. <coughs> it can take an hour and a half to get across from one side of fame to the other. Um, but it is... Uh, it's technically an oasis, being a fertile area surrounded by desert. Um, this satellite map will show you, give a, give a better idea of the, the layout. This little s stick here, the, the stem of the bud, is where the famous water supply comes in from the Nile Valley. <coughs> it's, uh, there's a river called the Bahar Yusuf which is a distributary of the Nile. It comes, it, it leaves the Nile up in Upper Egypt around Asyut, just north of Asyut, and follows the Nile along its west side until it gets to Beni Suez, where it turns off and comes into the Fayum. So this is the, the Fayum's entire water supply coming in here. Um, people think of it as a canal, but it's actually, a, it's a natural river. It's a distributary of the Nile. And then uh, water is uh, distributed all the way around Fayum to keep uh, keep the farming going. The lowest part of the, the province is up in the north where the lake is. The lake is about 45 meters below sea level. And so there's a gradient, quite a strong gradient from the entry to Fayum here down towards the lake from 
about 23 metres above sea level here to about 45 metres below. Um, and that leads to some interesting landscapes in parts of Fame that you don't see in other parts of Egypt where you see terrace cultivation, you see, you see slope, we have hills, we go up and down hills. And in the rest of Egypt, that's only in the desert, but we have it in the, within the green land too. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about these three places, Komashim, Nazla and Tunis, basically. But bear in mind the, the position of the lake, this is uh, uh, in the north. This is the largest natural lake in Egypt. And of course, it's uh, dwarfed by Lake Nasser, but Lake Nasser is an artificial lake. So Lake, lake Karun, uh, or and Birka, as they call it in Arabic, and locally they know it as in Birka, uh, which is a word, if you look it up in the dictionary, it tells you it means a pond. And um, so it's a rather large pond we have there. And this is what it looks like. Green land, very fertile green land on the southern uh, shores, right down to the shore of the lake, and then the northern shore is all barren <coughs> desert, but very dramatic deserts, some beautiful desert hills, scarps, uh, going up in stages right up, up to the uh, Gebel Kastrani uh, formation up here. And uh, the further west you go along the lake <coughs> towards Tunis, the more dramatic the lake scenery is because the lake becomes narrower, the, so the desert is closer and the desert hills are higher, so it really becomes quite scenic atmosphere as you go along. The lake is salt about as salty as the sea because it's below sea level and so whatever water reaches it the only outlet is evaporation so there's no other outlet there are no streams going off because it's, it's below sea level so <coughs> as the water evaporates of course it leaves behind salt and then takes salt with it that's why salt has become much more salty over time in ancient times um, up until Greek and Roman times, probably it was quite fresh. You could probably use it for cultivation, but you can't anymore. It's much too salty. Some fishing in the lake, <coughs> um, but it's become quite polluted in the last few years, and the, the big fishing boats are no longer working on the lake. But these guys still go out with their big nets, and they haul in uh, white bait. You know, the little, little silvery fish with the call it in uh, Australia. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> agriculture is the mainstay of the region. Uh, it is largely an agricultural region. There's very little industry. Um, so, and water being the basis of that, water has to be brought into any field that's going to be cultivated. Little runnels, there's a very complex system of uh, irrigation uh, on hand. Fields are dug and prepared and flooded, and then crops are planted. Here they're planting tomatoes. This is a winter scene. Um, this picture was taken a few years ago, but, but it's not pretty much like this now. So you've got um, big fields um, of um, Egyptian clover, they're seen, and then fields of cal calendula marigold. Uh, and then wheat. This is all wheat behind here. That's wheat. That's wheat. This is uh, the seam again. Sunflowers. Wheat harvest. Um, late spring. Date harvest. Very good dates. These. And the. Um, Farm animals include obviously camels. Uh, the camels, by the way, are used for uh, as beasts of burden to transport uh, heavy loads to and from fields which are not accessible by uh, wheeled vehicle. A lot of the farms are very small, uh, small plots, and they're often quite away from, from villages, and there are usually no roads leading to them. So 
uh, very often the only way farmers can get their crops back from the fields to the room is using cannon. That's why they're still used um, today. Buffaloes um, mainly kept for milk. Cows, a few. Donkeys used with ubiquitous and for transport down the fields. Wildlife include uh, foxes, mongooses, um, and there's a, a species of wild cat called a swamp cat, known in Arabic as um, It's I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, it's very difficult to <laughs> uh, come across and photograph, but it's, it's about probably a good two, two or maybe even three times the size of a domestic cat. It's a big cat. And when you see it from a distance, you see it's tufted ears and it looks like a lynx. A lot smaller than a lynx, but that's the kind of thing. Someday I'm going to get a picture of it. And this mongoose was in my garden last year. <laughs> and birds, uh, white-breasted kingfisher, very colorful, very noisy, raucous bird. A little egret, these are just a sample of the bird life we have. Flamingos on the lake, there's a, a, quite a big population of flamingos on Lake Peruma. Um, some of them are migratory, they, so in the winter you have like two or three thousand birds, in the summer maybe two or three hundred. And um, because uh, there's a population that stays through the year, but then there's a bigger population that comes and goes and migrate. I think, I'm, I'm guessing they come from um, Turkey and, and places in Eastern Europe um, for, the, for the winter. These are juveniles, you can tell because they've got no colour in the wings. But they're quite spectacular birds to have around them. A rare visitor we had a couple of years ago, a demoiselle, demoiselle crane, <coughs> um, dropped in for a short visit. They apparently migrate across Egypt every year, but at a great height. They, they don't bother landing here, most usually. They're going from somewhere in Eastern Europe, down to somewhere around Chad, Sudan, that kind of area. But there were four that, that came down that one particular year and we were lucky enough to see them. And Golden Oriole, another regular visitor, comes in the mulberry season, loves mulberries. If you've got a mulberry tree, watch out for the Golden Oriole. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Komashim up here is on the uh, right at the edge of Fayum on the end. This is the road coming from Cairo here. So you come down uh, across the desert from Cairo, past Komashim and then into the Fayum. So Komashim, the potters here make these kind of pots. Very large, sometimes extremely large uh, pots, mostly decorative for um, gardens, courtyards, um, Hotels and resorts all over Egypt use these pots and around their, their gardens, and um, they ship them abroad. They're, they're exported um, to Europe as well. This is where it happens. This is uh, the pottery of Komashim. great variety of, of sizes, shapes, and uh, decorations, and it, they're all done to order. Like, uh, you talk to the potters and ask them what, you know, what, how do they define these different shapes and sizes? They say, oh, we just do what the customer asks us to do. So the customer will come and say, I want a big thing like this with squiggles on it, and round and tall, whatever, and they do it. So that's why you get this great jumble of uh, of different uh, kinds of things. Um, a lot of rejects, because things get broken either in the firing or in the transportation or whatever, so they just chuck them aside and, uh, and go on. But the, these beautiful shapes, these big round ones here, but they're cracked and broken. And they specialize in these, in making these enormous pots. They can make pots up to two and a half meters tall. And um, I don't think anybody else in uh, Egypt is making pots of that, on that scale. 
they're made in stages. We'll see in a minute how they're made. There's a, that's an example. That's one of the potters there called um, Goma. And he's a bit shorter than me, so, you know, potted someone else's potter's time. There. They start off with these um, soaking pits to mix the mud. Um, and they use a mix of Aswan clay, which is brought in um, obviously from Aswan. It's a particular kind of very fine red uh, powder. Uh, comes in as a dry powder and they mix it up. And they mix it here with um, ordinary Nile mud. That is mud from the fields or the streams or the ditches. Um, in these soaking pits get it all nice and integrated and then they pull it out, they, they let it drain, they dry it out to, to its right consistency, then wheel it into the workshop in, in barrows like this, stomp on it a lot to get it fully uh, smoothed out, make sure no uh, air bubbles and uh, gaps in it, <coughs> and then start um, turning the pots on the, on the wheels. The, um, all the work of polishing is done on wheels. Um, for some reason they use a different word in Arabic to, to the other potters for their wheels. They call their, they call their wheel hagar. Most potters, like in Tunis and, and Nezal, they call it a bleb. But here it's a hagar, um, and they, uh, he's making quite a small pot there. This guy is making a series of small pots from a column. Um, this is like one great column of clay and he starts forming the pot on the top of the column and then slices it off when it's done, puts it aside and then starts forming the next one. Saves shifting lumps of clay back and forth and everything like so you can get to do exactly the same ones here. And then this is how the big pots are, are built up. On, on the left here this is one that's been made in stages up to now and set aside to dry partially they they take it back to the wheel and add once it's dried out enough to be uh, uh, be able to stand on its own basically not collapse under the weight of extra mud they add uh, these layers of mud in what we call a fatila it's like a sausage of, of mud um, putting it around the edge like that roughly and then smoothing it out and, and shaping the, the pot up so in the big pots, like the, the two and a half meter pots, they, they may work in as many as 20 stages to get that kind of size of pot. So they will build it up stage at a time, set it aside for drying for a few hours or a day or, or so, bring it back next and so on. Keep building it up uh, like this. And then these are the ones that are set out for drying between um, being continued and if you've got a collapsing ceiling, you, you need to make a makeshift column of, of pots and stones and things to keep the roof up. That's the kiln. There, there are a number of kilns, obviously. This is, this is just one kiln. Uh, there are, about, I don't know, a dozen or so, perhaps, of Komashi. Very, very large uh, buildings. That's inside the dome of this kiln. They're probably about four meters square. And, um, I'm not sure how high the dome is, probably four meters or so. And the floor of the kiln <coughs> is, uh, has these holes because the fire is lit underneath the floor. There's a, there's a separate entrance to the, around the back to, to build the fire underneath here. And all these uh, gaps are in the floor to, to bring the heat up into the, into the kiln. So they, they fill the kiln with the shaped um, pots, seal the door with old pots and mud. That's a big doorway, you'll see it open the same, but they, that, that, that's, that has to be temporarily sealed up while they're doing the firing. Um, and then they start the fire around the back underneath the, the floor. This is a great pile of um, wood here and sawdust here. When I went and was looking at them shoveling this stuff in, I thought, why are they putting sand into the furnace? That will surely put the fire out. It's not sand, it's sawdust. <laughs> and they can use as much as three tons of wood and, and a ton of sawdust for, for one firing. That's a heck of a lot of fuel <laughs> to use. 
They fire for about eight or nine hours, get the temperature up to about 800, 900 degrees. Then they let it cool slowly uh, for two or three days uh, before they open up. And they're shoveling in more sawdust, stoking the fire. It's a great big stoker this, this guy had here. Huge roaring furnace in there. And then when you, they open up, that's those are the stack pots inside. <clears throat> ready to be taken out. Um, and this is a long, careful, complicated operation. They have to dismantle what they've mm. put together inside before, one by one, carefully. And they're very heavy, these pots, and also still hot. This is three days later, and the pots are still hot. Mm. So they're used to it, and sometimes they use cloth to, to hold the food stock for burning the hands. But uh, I think they've got fairly calloused hands when they do it. So they bring them out. You see there's one there with that with this scar, there's a big crack in it when you fire in. They inspect them when they bring them out and then start taking them down to the trucks. So here, uh, this is one of the trucks that will transport these pots to this particular one that's going to Hagada. They were taking these to some resort <coughs> down in Hagada. Uh, and the potter goes with them, the chief potter, the one who was standing next to that very tall one, right hand, travels with the truck because he wants to oversee the unloading himself, make sure there's no damage done and so on. So they're ready to go off to uh, Havada. And, um, and that's the next generation um, getting involved in the, in the uh, making of the pots. And Nazla down here is, um, I forgot to mention actually, the, 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 the coal machine potters were originally um, sited in Fayum City. Um, traditionally they were in an area called Sheikh Hassan. They were moved by the government when people were complaining about the pollution, the smoke, um, and then they were shifted out of the city entirely up to Komoshim. So they've only been at Komoshim for, I think, about 30 years or so. Um, now, Nesla is a different situation altogether. This is a village that's been um, making pots as far back as anybody knows, certainly a lot further back than anyone can remember. Um, when you talk to the guys there, they've, they'll they talk about their, they, they know their genealogies. They'll, they'll say, oh, I'm the seventh generation or the ninth generation to be making pots here in, in the village. And their great, great, great grandfather was a man called Alpach, who we don't know whether he started the, the, the potteries there or whether he came in, there was existing potteries and he kind of, uh, took over the, the business. But I suspect it goes back a lot longer than just eight or nine generations. These are the kind of pots they make in Nesla. Basically they're water pots. They're for keeping, storing and cooling water. Um, two main types, this one is called, these round ones, it's called a bukla. And this is unique to Nesla. Um, and these are called zir which is fairly common throughout Egypt, you're familiar with Zir. They're made in many places, not just here. But the only place you'll find Bukla is Nazma. This is a map um, from middle of the 19th century, and it, sh it shows very nicely the situation of Nazma here. Uh, it's a French map, it's written in a different spelling, but that's in Nazma. This long line here is one of the two main drainage channels of the Fayum, the other one is, is over here, going that way. These take excess water from the farmland of the Fayum down to the lake. Mm. And this one that Nesla sits on the edge of is actually quite a deep, uh, steep-sided valley. It's called uh, Masraf and Wedi. Mm. And <clears throat> it's quite um, scenic. In, in places, because this is where you see the terrace cultivation. 
Here it is on a map from the description of Egypt from 1799. There's Nazareth, and you'll see it's on the edge of the valley there, going up through the fields. This is what it looks like. This is what I was saying earlier. This is a kind of landscape you don't see anywhere else in Egypt, with this terrace kind of cultivation along the sides. Stream, uh, quite a vigorous stream running along the bottom of the valley. And the pottery sit down at the bottom of the, the valley, on, right next to the stream. Uh, the village of Nazareth is up here on the top. If any of you have seen a couple of old Egyptian movies, um, Duat Karawan and mm -hmm. Mustagi, both of those movies had scenes filmed here on, around the potteries coming up the hill and down the, to the village. This is the, the, the village and the potteries as I first saw them in 1980. So this is an antique photograph. Um, and it's uh, changed. This was uh, about 15 years ago. Still, um, the, the towers, of course, these are the kilns. That's what the, the towers are. And now, today, this picture was taken last year. You can't see the kilns so clearly. They're still there, but there's all these new buildings that have been put up. Um, some new workshops here. A couple of new kilns have been put in as well. I mean, a new modern electric kiln, or gas, sorry, gas-fired kilns. This, this is now a new visitor center, a museum they've set up. It's built out of Bukla. This is about 20,000 Bukla went into the building of these, this complex of buildings here. So there's a new use for these pots. Because obviously these water pots, the use and demand is declining because of the spread of modern refrigeration. Uh, most people, when I first went to Fame 40 years ago, most people had a booklet in their home to keep the water cool and drink from. Now you very, very rarely see them. There's much less demand. So the potters, the, the, the business has declined. They're making less pots. There are fewer potters working. And <clears throat> they're diversifying as much as they can. They, they're going into more decorative things like garden lights and, and things like this. But this is, to me, is a very interesting idea of building with, with the booklet because this gives you natural insulation. Mm. You've got air trapped in the booklet. As long as you've got air trapped between outside and inside, it means on a hot day it's cool inside, on a cold day it's warm inside. Mm. This is the scene now. This is one of the new uh, gas-fired uh, kilns there, and some new workshops there. But uh, most of the potters prefer to stick with the old kilns and their own workshops. And these are all the pots being laid out to dry before firing. So these, this and this are both uh, bookla, different sizes. They make them in different sizes, um, and they are they're the traditional water pots of the Fayum. And the reason they cool the pots is uh, they cool the water is they are porous. So and they're deliberately porous. So when you fill them with water, the water seeps through the wall of the pot and comes onto the outside, where on a hot day it'll evaporate. And the evaporation cools the pot and the contents. So this is the brilliant engineering behind these, these water pots. Um, what is this? This is booklet. What is this? Is this is right. water in pot. You cannot use it for... No, this is, this is one of the innovations uh, having been forced to diversify, uh, they, this is, they call it kanun shag. So it's a, it's a tea oven, it's a tea uh, stove. Mm. So you build a fire inside of it, mm. and you put your kettle or your teapot on the top here. Right? Mm. <laughs> um, because it, but it's basically the same formation as a book, and they simply then, having finished the thing, they cut a hole in the side and adjust the top and fix it so it can be used for making tea. Well, maybe they use it as nests for the pigeons to put their eggs inside. There are others, but especially for for the pigeon nests, yes. Um, and that's uh, they call um, they call it uh, adus, I think, which is a pigeon nest that you see built into the walls of pigeons. 
knots. Here's another diversification. This is called the Defea. And this is for warming a courtyard. You, you build a fire in here, and there's the chimney. And what in Europe they call a chimenea. Um, and very handy, very practical. For example, to heat. Yeah, you still in Germany use some something like this. Yes. In the older places. Yes, in Europe they're quite popular, common. My brother has one in England, he's got not from here, but he's got <laughs> one that he bought in England. This um, this is called a Sogdeb. And this is like a buckler, but the on one side of it, at the bottom here, it's flattened, so it's so it stands lies flat on the ground with an extended neck. And this is an artificial rabbit burrow for people breeding rabbits. This is uh, a uh, safa, and this is for uh, keeping water cool, not for us, but for uh, domestic fowl, for ducks and hens, uh, chickens in the courtyard. It acts in the same way, it cools the water. So for the, for the chickens and ducks, it's much better for them having cool water to drink than it is to put it in a metal or plastic tub, it's going to warm up in the, in the heat of the summer. That's what um, this thing is over here. You can have a look afterwards. That's the safa. So you can examine it more closely. So you said safa. Safa. Yeah. Seen hefe. That's what? Not sad, no. Seen safa. Yeah, it means in the Bible. And in the Bible, Jesus said to the, at the last uh, supper, uh -huh. he said, who immerse his hand with me in the Sahfa, he will be the meat of the Oh really? And in the Bible, what is the meaning of the word there? What is it? Who immerse his hand, the, 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 the eating at the yes, last yes. supper, mm. who immerse with me and feed him, and okay. Jesus feed him, he, he will deliver me to the to the Roman, it means the Yahudi. Yahu oh, I see, yeah. okay, right, yes. So, so Sahfa, it came from 2000 years. Okay, well, that's a very good term, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, basically the same as Sahfa, but it's, it's <laughs> all the preparations is making couscous. Mm -hmm. um, so, they start off the process by mixing the mud. And here, they, there's no aswan clay used here. This is all Nile mud. They take it directly from the stream, just just below the potteries here, or from the edge of the fields, or whatever. They put it in a, a, a soaking pit called the balla, and mix it with water. Let it all soak together, and um, uh, and then it's ready to be mixed. In the case of the uh, the bukla, they mix it with chopped straw. Mm -hmm. The chopped straw in the in the clay during the firing, of course, all burns off, and that helps to increase the porosity of the of the pot. Uh, it also keeps it much lighter; it keeps the whole structure much lighter and easier to carry and transport. The workshop of the buckler maker. Number one here, that this is where they keep the clay, the mixed clay, ready for for moulding under a plastic uh, sheet so it doesn't dry out. They uh, knead it and, and pound it, first of all, they'll put on this block. Um, the potter will sit here on the mat. This is um, a concave depression in the ground, they call it an airlid mould, which helps to form the shape of the buckler. Um, and this is the other kind of mould they use, also called airlid, which is convex, it's like a sort of a hammer, basically. It's a hammer and anvil technique they use for beating the, the clay. They need water and chopped straw to, to keep the mix going. And this stick is called a tara, and this is for beating the outside after the, the pot is formed to get the um, thickness even all the way around the pot. So here's, uh, here he is making a couple of nearly finished ones uh, here. But he, he starts off by throwing this lump of mud into the, the uh, depression on the ground, sprinkle a bit of chopped straw to start with, like you would when you're kneading dough, you put flour on the tabletop, it's the same 
No, this, he does it without the turntable. This is the, this is what's different about this particular technique. So how how you envision? You will see. This is a, this is a I will show you. <laughs> I'll show you right now. He starts banging it into the depression now, just to get the rough outer shape. And then he picks up the other end, the, the convex hammer, and starts beating it, beating, 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 until it gets into, he builds it up very, very, very skillfully and quickly into this almost perfect sphere. And he keeps on beating inside, turning it as he's, uh, as he's working. And then he's, there he uses the tara on the outside to get the, the thickness even on, all the way around. Yeah. No. How he makes these balls more genius? <laughs> Sorry? How he makes these balls more genius? Well, that's the skill. These are, these are people who learn their trade. From, from, they start as children learning how to manipulate the clay. And if you or I tried this, I think we'd just make a huge mess. But these, these people have been doing it since they were this high. And uh, they know exactly what they're doing, and they do it very quickly and incredibly skillfully. So they set out the pots to dry in the sun, and you've got a variety here. These are full bukla, these are safet here, which will you know, be like this one. Uh, and these are bukla, which will still yet to have the neck put on. They add the neck afterwards, after it's dried for a while. Here's one that's had the neck added. And there they're adding the necks. They, they, here they use a, a turntable yeah, yeah. to put the wheel, well, only to put the necks on. The actual oh. pot itself is formed without it. Um, and sometimes they'll coat the pots with a, a yellow oxide, which in the firing turns red to give a, a better colour to, to the finished pots. The pot is yellow. Is it? Now the other kind of pot they make there, the zeo, this is done on a turntable. Um, and like the pots of Komashim, it's done in stages. They make part of it, set it to dry for a while, come back, add a few uh, layers and carry on. But the same principle, it's deliberately porous in order to cool water. Uh, this is uh, obviously an Ola. Um, same, made in the same way, but on a smaller scale. This is another kind of uh, uh, tea stove Colonel uh, done on the on the wheel, and that's what they call a manad, which is for carrying hot coals around. You, you light a fire in it, and you let the fire die down to the coals, and then you carry the coals into your house to keep the room warm. And he he, he put opening here so that there is a, a flow of, of air, air circulation coming from up to down, so the the, the fire will not uh, put up. I'm not sure if the hole connects to the inside. It may just be going through the base of the pot. We have to have a look at it to see. You may be right. I assume this is for for uh, eddy currents, for the for the for the possibly air yeah to circulate and to keep the, the coal or, or wood ignited. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. I think that's that's entirely possible. So. To make the zero, this, they, they take the mud and they mix it not with chopped straw as the butler, but they, with um, ash. Um, so it gives it, it, this gives the lightness and porosity, but but because they're bigger structures, the zero is much bigger than the butler. It needs more solidity to it, so they mix it with ash rather than chopped straw. Um, and then, so this is how they work on the booklers. Again, there's the pile of clay to start with. The potter sits here. There's his turntable driven by the foot. It's a foot-driven mm. turntable. And this it takes the, you know, your zeer can either have a tapered bottom or a flat bottom, mm. the two different types. If it's a tapered bottom, then they put the tapering into that mm. receptacle on the turntable there to, to be able to manipulate it. If it's a flat bottom, they take that off and just stand it straight on. Yeah. But they, these are the bottoms of the, of the zeers ready for ready for further work. They've been drying in the sun for a while. And uh, and this is how they build it up. This is a zero. It's probably built in three or four different stages. You see he's making the same kind of sausage as we saw at Commachine. 
push it around the top and then smooth it out. Yeah. Notice the string on the pot here. The string is put on to keep the pot in shape while it's still uh, quite wet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Before it's thoroughly dried out. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it could slump. So it's a temporary thing. They put this string round to keep it in shape. They put on another stage, dry it. Then they take the string off, lower down, and put it on higher up to continue. Um, but the string leaves marks in the in the pots, which you can see after the firing. If you look at the zoo, you would usually see these kind of string marks. And it's very interesting. And, I, and an Egyptologist told me that they had excavated broken pottery from Karan. It's a, a, a Greco-Roman site um, near Komashim, and found. Uh, piece of broken pot with the, exactly the same string marks on as we see today. So in other words, it's an ancient technique that is still used. So he, he puts out a rough uh, sausage on around the top, then he'll smooth it off and keep drying and finish off. And there he is with his proud knees finished pot. Puts a little squiggle of decoration around with his fingers, the thing still spinning around on the turntable. Those are the zero out to dry in the sun. Can I put a comment? Yes, please. <clears throat> Before 1950, we used to drink from zero. Mm. Most of the division <laughs> in the village. I personally use the zero when I go to the countryside. Mm -hmm. They bring the water from life, put it in the zero, and, <clears throat> and they, they keep the uh, uh, a seed for this uh, zir, it drops, drops water where, and something may, something may uh, better, yeah. and connected by a tap. Ah, uh, yes. So we open the tap, mm -hmm. we drink from the tap. So the water is being filtered by dropping it through, yeah, through the pot into the receptacle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course. Because it was not 100% clean, because we, we, bring, we bring it from the line side, and the, ah, the old ladies also come every morning to fill the enzir. Ah. The, the old job, the, the Falahat, mm. came every morning at 7 or 8 in the morning yeah. with the, uh, carrying the water and put it in the zir. Yeah, and and the, 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 the house lady of the Dawar, this is important job because without this they cannot they cannot make uh, yeast, they cannot uh, make uh, bread, they yeah. cannot uh, drink everything. Right. I assume that it takes the mud out because this small it will filter the water. Filter, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but what important. about bacteria and other bacteria and other things? Yeah. This is uh, this is uh, this is a dangerous thing. That's no, why. That was the risk. Of, that was yeah, the risk. that's why no. Abdul Halim Hafiz has has bacteria. No. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a way of life that's m mostly disappeared now. Here, the this is the kiln in now in um, in uh, Nazra, and. Like the one in at Komashim, same kind of idea of fire being built underneath. Um, these supports around, which support the pots above the fire, they call these supports hamir, donkeys. Um, these are the donkeys that hold the pots up above the fire. So they, first of all, there's a window into the kiln. There's a man inside who's gone in from the top, probably, and he his job is to step stack the pots inside the kiln while these his helpers hand them in through the window to him and he takes them and stacks them up carefully inside and he builds up and builds up and as he builds up he's climbing on top of the pots and going higher and higher within the kiln he's putting stones around between the pots and the walls to allow the heat to distribute evenly around uh, the whole kiln and when he's getting higher up beyond where the window is here, that's now full up, so they can't pass pots to him anymore. So what they do, one guy throws a pot up to the guy standing on the top and he hands it into the one inside. 
they finish off, uh, close the top with old pots and bits and pieces to stop too much heat escaping, keep it all in. Um, seal up the window again with old pots and, and mud and get the fire going down below. Um, they don't fire it very high, uh, very hot here. It's about, they get up to about four or five hundred degrees for only two or three hours and then they let it cool for 24 hours before opening it. And that's what it looks like when it's opened. In the old days, um, because of the hillside, that you know, the pottery's at the bottom of the hill and the village is at the top, they used donkeys and these huge panniers to carry the, the pots up the hill. Um, that's all changed now because they've built a road down to the potteries so that the trucks can come down. But you see that how that's piled high now with Bukla and Zir, and there's more there to be stamped up. And these go off to market, the, well, it's a big weekly market in Flame City, but I think they go, they take these pots to Upper Egypt and other places as well to sell. And of course you can buy them at the potteries themselves, these are all for sale, here are the Bukla, Buklas, and then these ones you'll recognise a different kind of pot, and they're not from Fayum. These are made in Upper Egypt, in around Enna, mm. called um, Babas. Mm. Right? So what they do, they swap. The, the Fayumi potters send their bukla to Enna, and the Enna potters send their Babas to Fayum, and they sell in both places. This is Fayum's uh, weekly market, with the Zir and Bukla on sale, and Babas as well there. And if you've got pots left over, you can make a, um, a workshop out of them, group of building. So now Tunis, which is the place many of you would be a lot more familiar with, this little village, until 30 years ago, or even less, it was a pretty much unknown little village, tiny, tiny village, on a little, on a ridge overlooking the lake uh, here. Um, it's now become quite a, a destination and a, a centre for ecotourism as well as for the pottery industry. People come here to go out into the desert, to Wadi Rayan, to the Valley of the Whales, they go sandboarding, they swim in the lakes, and they go horse riding, so it's a whole new ecotourism scene going on there now. And this is the kind of pottery you find in Tunis village. This is a wonderful piece of my personal collection. This is a piece made by one of the potters called Ghazel, Mohammed, um, uh, Mohammed Saleh. Um, he um, actually used cabbage leaf to impress into the clay and then cut around it and then coloured it and fired it to make this lovely cabbage leaf dish. But how they put this glaze? Sorry? They put a glaze, a layer of glaze. It's glazed, yes. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you through the process. I'll show you the glazing. So this is Tunis village, uh, part of it here. It's on a, something of a ridge along here. A little bit higher than the lake, and you can sort of, so you, you've got great views of the lake and the desert beyond uh, from the village. Um, lovely old um, pigeon tower in the centre of the village. This goes back at least a hundred years. We think this pigeon tower. Yeah, what, what is this? This, this is Tunis, Tunis village in Fayum. Um, these are these are pots, of course, that have been made possibly by the people at either Komushim or, or Nazra to uh, some are entry holes into the inside which pigeons can fall through to get into the pigeon loft and others are within the walls and closed and they can nest in those. Don't they uh, welcome by the tourists the foreigners to come and live in Tunis? Yes, there are there are many foreigners living in Tunis now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so as you see so the history of Tunis um, as, a, as a pottery village is all down to this lady, Eveline Poré. Um, she came from Switzerland in 1960 to Egypt first. Uh, she arrived 
coincidentally because she'd studied ceramics at a university in Switzerland, um, and her father was a, um, a pastor in, a, I think, an evangelical church in Cairo. So he was working here. She came out to visit and just to look around, see what's, uh, what's Egypt like. While she was here, she met um, Ramses Lisa Wasif, who was running, of course, his uh, art center in Karamea. Karamea. She got involved in that. She worked with him for a while, uh, learned a lot about his um, ideas about uh, training children to, to in certain arts, in his case called mostly tapestry, and then she went into pottery. Um, in 1963, uh, she was she was married to the Egyptian poet uh, Sayyid Hager, and together they came to Tunis. They found this uh, tiny village in the middle of nowhere, very remote. They said, we're going to build a house here. They built a house, lived there until 1967, when, because she was a foreigner, she had to leave the country because of the 1967 war. She stayed outside for some time, um, met her second husband, Michelle, there in the picture. Um, they came back to fame together in 1978, set up a pottery studio, he's also a potter, set up their own pottery studio, and they found that the children of the village were quite fascinated by what's going on at this, this pottery, this stuff, these things they're making. And the children were themselves, on, on their own uh, volition, were modeling animals and uh, tractors and all sorts from the mud of the irrigation canals. So they were putting together these little models um, and Evelyn said, look, if you come along and we show you how to make this in clay, we'll fire it for you, and then it's something you can keep forever, rather than just mud that will crumble. <laughs> so they got, this is how they, the children started getting interest in the pottery. There was so much interest that Evelyn and Michelle then decided, well, this is worthwhile opening a school, which they did in 1990. So they opened the Fayoum Pottery mm -hmm. School in 1990. And the school is still functioning. Evelyn sadly passed away last year. She was 81 years old. Michelle is still there. The school is run by their son, Angelo, who um, grew up in the village. And there have been several generations of graduates from the school since then. Um, the earlier graduates, and when I say graduates, there's no formal system, so it's not a, um, they go for training. They're taught in all the uh, techniques that they need to know about how to mix the clay, how to form it, how to um, decorate it, how to glaze it, how to fire it, and then how to sell and market it. They do this um, for five or six years. They start as young children, maybe eight, nine, ten years old, study for five or six years. Then they're free to go off and open their own pottery studios, which is what many of them have done. This is why they're now somewhere between 25 and 30 independent pottery workshops in the Twins village now. So it's a very, very, very busy place, but it all goes back to Evelyn and the pottery school. Do, do we have any relation with Francis Lisa Wasif from Kaparamea? Uh, no formal relation, no, but it's based on the same kind of principles because they both believed in, in the principle that every child is an artist mm -hmm. and and if you give the children the, 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 the right surroundings and the right information and training and help, then, then you can bring the artist out of the child. Yes. Same principle that Ramses Lisa Wasser does with, with, with the tapestries and Evelyn was doing with the, with the pottery. But no formal relation. <coughs> so this is inside this, the school. Um, lovely big old open space. And then the graduates go out and they open their own workshops. This is the showroom of the pottery school. <coughs> Raulia was one of the first graduates to open her own studio. Um, and one of the first women, uh, village women, to go into pottery. There's Raulia with her trademark uh, colors and decoration. And you see plates like this, it's pretty much Raulia. Yeah. All, all her brothers, as you can see from the family there. Um, Mohammed and Karim were both uh, graduates of the school and then taught there when they, uh, in later years, then they set up their own pottery 
studio. This is Muhammad, and this is his brother Kareem, and then their younger brother Ahmed, who specializes in these wonderful animals. It's very um, vivid, vital animals that he creates out of clay. Abdus Sattar, also an early graduate. Those, those, those children, when they start? Yes. Yeah, the, yes, all these people you've seen, Rawi Abdus Sattar, Muhammad and Kareem, they started as children, like nine, ten year old children. Mm. I visited the, the Habamir recently, since a year, and uh, his daughter, I want to know her name, despite she is uh, out of my relative disease or something. Suzanne. Suzanne, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, she was claiming that she cannot find uh, find me or to work. Well, she told me, we don't have children now. Why? Mm. No. She said, all are all having, uh, having internet. <laughs> so all the, the children using telephone, uh, mobile, and they don't come to the workshop. Well, yes, I, I met sympathize. I met a plenty of ladies about 50 or 60 years old. Mm -hmm. She said, I started here for free. Yeah. Because what he did, he was living in Giza, taking to the zoo. Mm -hmm. He sold the villa and went to Habermeyer, built a house, and on the, on the roof, built about 10 rooms. Yeah, it's a wonderful project, Haramea, and, it, and, it, and it's still going. And in, in the same way, the pottery school in Tunis is still going. They still have uh, is, students. They have good young 10-year-olds going now to, to learn the trade. This is how they prepare the clay uh, here, as we saw at Komashi. Basically, it's a big soaking pit. The, uh, the clay here is a mix of Aswan clay, something called ball clay, which is imported, I think, from Britain. Uh, kaolin and talc and there are very precise ratios they like to mix these uh, different elements in to get the right kind of clay that they want to work with so they mix it all up in these um, uh, tanks then set, set it out to, to get rid of the excess moisture cover it in cloth and then stamp on it this is you know there's a lot of kneading is required for this clay first of all with the feet and later with the hands just before they work then they cut pieces off and start preparing it for, for working. This is the kind of um, wheel that they use in tunes mostly. A few of the potters have elec electric powered wheels, but most of them still use this kick wheel. And these beautiful um, delev, they call it, uh, they're made by a local carpenter, especially for the potters. So they start <coughs> a lump of clay uh, spin the wheel with the foot and right foot usually and the first thing to do is prepare the clay and they do whatever kind of shape of pot they're going to make they always start by making a big tower like this and then they press it right back down again and this is to sort of make sure it's all full there are no air holes no uh, gaps and it's all and, and it increases the elasticity of, of the clay as well makes it more malleable so you need pushing it down again right down and then he starts to make to form the shape of the pot that he wants by putting his hand in pulling out pulling out slowly from the top pulling out pushing down using a tool there called the salif to to smooth out the inside walls and then when he's got his basic shape done cuts uh, with a wire a wire cutter just through the to separate from the from the base sets it aside to dry It'll dry for a few hours or a day or so, depending on the weather. It changes from season to season if it's hot or cool weather. And after it's dried, then it's brought back to the table. Oh, just, oh, sorry, these are the tools, some of the tools they use. Mm. These are plastic or metal um, scrapers are called serif. These are used for shaping the inside of the pots. Uh, little wooden spatulas for cutting or, or shaping. This, these are called migred, which are for scraping off excess clay around the bottom, which you see them doing here. This is a pot that's been dried for a while, gone back onto the turntable to take off the excess. He's cutting with the migred 
around there to take to make the stand of the, of the mm -hmm. mug. And all these all the shavings get recycled. It goes back and soaked again in water to to be used again, so it's not wasted. And at this stage, you can also add handles. You know, you've made the basic mug on the, on the turntable. You have to add a handle by, by hand. And then you start putting what potters in England call slip, uh, two slips, batana, they call it in Arabic. There are, this is what they call gomadi, it's a grey slip. And this acts to bind between the, the second slip, which is a white one, and the glaze that goes on after, mm. binds it to the, to the flame in the fire. Without this grey slip, it would all uh, just fall apart. Once they put the second uh, white slip on and it dries very quickly, then you can start decorating. You can either carve in with a stylus, you can draw donkeys, flowers, whatever you feel like on your, on your mug. Um, and you can paint on, the colours go on. The colours, when they're in the pots on the potter's desks, all look basically grey. You can't, I can't tell the difference between the colours. They'll tell me, oh, this is blue, or this is red, or this is green, and you have to take the word for it, because the colours don't show up until after firing. Yeah. But they know what the colours are, they know what, and, and how they're using them. Um, now they're putting the glaze on. It's an opaque um, uh, coating. It dries milky white. Once it goes on, you can't see the decoration underneath. Mm. Disappears. And you've no idea what, what kind of colors may be under these, on these uh, wonderful hippos here. Then they, we get onto the kiln for the firing. Here they're making a kiln or putting it together, finalizing it. The kilns are also made locally. Um, metal frames are made by a local um, Khaddad smith. And then the potters themselves line the kilns with uh, glass wool, which is you know, um, heat proof, uh, because they get up to very high temperatures. So they're just putting this one together here. Then they use, um, they have removable shelves that they can stack with inside the kiln and then build up, they put pots on the lower shelf, put some supports, put the next shelf and, and so on up to the top. You can see here how the glazed pots, you, you can vaguely make out there is some decoration underneath, but you can't tell what. And this is how they look until it's fired. And you'll see a couple of pictures down the line, you'll see this same kiln opened after firing. Closing the lid. And then they fire using um, diesel fuel. It drips in slowly. And they fire like this for the first three to three and a half hours, letting it drip through and slowly building up the heat. They don't want it to build up too fast. Um, and then about after three, three and a half hours, they then start introducing air with a electric blower mm. to, to force more air in to bring, bring the heat up and build up. They fire all together for about seven hours get the temperature up to over 1100 degrees, about 1150 usually, 1150 degrees. It's needed for the glazes. The early, for the Komashim and Nesla pot, they don't need to go that high because they don't have glazes. Mm -hmm. But if you're glazing, you've got to have the very high temperature. After, when they think it's about done, if they don't have a temperature gauge, what they do, they, they put little sample pieces in that they know they'll put pull out later. So these guys are opening up the lid to pull out uh, a sample which they'll let cool for a couple of minutes and if the colours look right they'll say that's it and they'll stop the firing. If the colours still look pale, not rich enough, they'll leave it for another five, ten minutes or something. And that's what the pots look like when you open up. The glaze becomes a glaze. What they sometimes do, if they want to get a very, this very metallic, um, shiny red glaze, they'll fire up to 1150, let the, uh, let the kiln cool down to about 700 degrees, and then introduce smoke. The 
smoke then reacts with the colors that are on the pot and turns this is actually turquoise the color that you're seeing is red in that you know, copper color is, is turquoise <coughs> but it turns copper colored with the smoke when they cool the thing down and this is another technique they use when they they fire fully and then let it cool back down to about 700 degrees they call it raku it's based on a japanese technique mm -hmm. japanese raku they call it raku, it's a slightly different apparently, it's not technically exactly the same as the Japanese do it, but you get this lovely um, crinkled result, this smoky, uh, uh, and spotted and <coughs> shackled surface. They use either chopped straw, or in this case, the dried leaves of Kalorina tree, which they collect, they put in a big tin tub. They pull the pots out of the kiln at around 700 degrees, drop them into the tub of Casarina in this case, and add some more maybe, and then put the lid on and let it all smoke away. And that's how they come out afterwards. Mm. The smoke and the, and the, and the way the, the dry fuel burns around uh, spontaneously with the hot pots creates these patterns in the, the glaze. And this is what they call raku. Even on the raccoon if you pot So all these pots then are, you know, as I said, 25 to 30 different potteries now in Tunis village. They all have their own showroom. This is the showroom of Mohammed Gomar. Um, all these, this work is his. The work here and here is uh, a relative of his called Ahmed Ali. He does slightly different work, so they kind of share a showroom. This is the Brothers Gamal, who you saw before, Mohammed Karim and Ahmed, that's their showroom. This is Abdus Sattar. Um, and, uh, and this is Mohammed Yusuf. And then this is just, I'm just going to show you a selection of the, uh, the pots now from different um, people. Well, these two, these first two are by Mohammed Gomar. That's by Mohammed Mahmoud. Abdus Sattar, also Abdus Sattar, Mahmoud Yusuf, uh, Ibrahim Kerim. This is the same um, potter who did the, the, what's on the cover of the book? Yeah, the book. Uh, Ahmed Ali, who has quite an individual style all of his own, quite different from, from what everybody else does. He experiments with shapes and textures and things. So he's one of his. That's another one of his. And that's another one of his, which is full of fun drawing of a donkey in a tree. Um, what would you call these? Condiment pots or something? You put salt and pepper and so on. And not mm -hmm. use it. Uh, May, this is a, what I call a bonbonniere. Mm -hmm. It's got a little lid, you put little chocolates or something inside it. Yeah. <coughs> These lovely figures are by Raghavan Ashraf, two brothers of Rao, we have to work independently. This is Ahmed Gamal's uh, wonderful, one of his wonderful gamosas. And some more of his animals. <coughs> That's uh, Tawfiq Saad. Amal and Mansour. That's Ibrahim again. Amal and Mansour. Amal and Mansour. Again, Amal and Mansour. This is Mahmoud Yusuf, Mahmoud Gomar. You see the quite you know, variety of shapes, colors, treatments, uh, textures, surfaces. Uh, Saleh, Saleh. Saleh and his brother Barakat, have, um, who are graduates of the pottery school, have gone to Luxor and opened a pottery school there now, on the West Bank, in Gorna. So if you're ever in Luxor, you'll see work like this that they're doing and teaching people in Luxor how to make this kind of pottery as well, which is a nice kind of uh, outreach extension. And that is by Mohammed uh, Mahmoud as well. That's all the, the sort of traditional pottery, if you like, or the sort of locally indigenous. Quite a lot of, uh, well, quite a few um, 
outsiders have gone into Tunis and started uh, working on their own. This particular man, Abdul Abouzid, passed away six years ago, was trained as a potter independently um, in Cairo, I believe. He's, he was from Banha. He went and settled in Tunis and he made his own pottery, in his own style, quite different from the rest of the village. This is one of his huge murals. This is, as you're seeing in there, it's probably about half life size. It's an enormous mural. He would lay out a massive slab of clay on a table, do all his decoration, the textures and shaping and so on, and then slice it into separate tiles, fire all the tiles separately, and then put it all back together after firing to make these uh, fantastic murals. And that's a potter that he made. He uses a soup, a soup tureen. That's another of his pots. And another. And his son, Hamouda, Muhammad Abzid, has continued the tradition. I mean, obviously, he learned, Hamouda learned as a child from his father. And he's gone on and, and uh, is now really a world class potter. He's been teaching. Uh, ceramic arts at the German University in Cairo for the last five years um, and he's doing some tremendous work. He, this is uh, one of his, and that's another, and that's another, and that's in his showroom. Mona Prince, who some of you will know as an AEC Press author, is a potter now in Fayoum. She settled there and makes her own pottery. She does very kind of abstract work kind of broken shell type things with interesting glazes and colours. <coughs> not meant to be used in any way, not like a bowl you can eat out of or a mug you can drink from, but a uh, very interesting art. This is ceramic art in, in the truer sense. This is some of her work. And she she will write uh, bits of, uh, in this case it's a, it's a Sufi um, saying, uh, she sometimes writes quotations from her own novels on her pottery, so introducing, mixing literature with ceramic art. And then this is the work of Heather Helmy, who's an artist who went to Tunis and took up pottery. Um, she kind of apprenticed herself to Abdus Sattar, and, and she uses his studio and works with him. She also has a studio in Old Cairo. This is some of her work. It's quite stunning, the colours uh, here. Fabulous pieces. And the end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so I'm very happy to take any questions. You yes, have. thank you, Neil, for this wonderful presentation. And I'm sure we have questions from our audience. Yes, uh, thank you for this uh, uh, useful talk, uh, useful uh, lectures. I, I personally enjoy it. And I think uh, all the audience get more knowledge about uh, uh, This is the end, but I would like to go back to the start. Yes. The start, uh, you showed us uh, Several uh, villages in Fayoum, uh, Pogmushim, and what do I use? Uh, Nazla. Nazla, yeah, but near Nazla is Wadi Wadi Rayan is out, yes, it's uh, yeah. away. So I, I have comments about it. Pogmushim in 1952, President Mohammed Najib went there and cultivated the first uh, tree in this area and there was a project to put uh, a forest of medium uh, trees in Komoshi. Ah. Okay. This is the time of uh, Najib. Yes. I didn't know that. It's yeah. good to know. Regarding Wadi, Wadi Rayan, I, have no, I don't have enough knowledge. But there was an argument between the church and the government. Why? Because some nuns from uh, from 
Dear Abu Mu'ad, do you understand? Yes, yes, I know you're talking about the monastery. Yes. They, they went yeah. there and they yeah, stayed that, that there. Was, I, I, that's religion and politics, and I think we probably yeah, prefer not to get into it. My question is why they insist to sit in this area while this area has nothing uh, for living? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can we ask questions related to the book if someone yeah. has something related to pottery and then we can have a discussion afterwards and we have okay. yeah. Anyone want to ask questions? Uh, I, I'd like to thank you to, so much for your presentation. Uh, but um, after have you been to Tunisia, haven't you ever thought about uh, um, setting up your own votaries, student votary as well, and go ahead and um, <laughs> after after going through all this stuff uh, for for a long time, uh, have you ever? That's an interesting Never. question. <laughs> well, to be honest, I, I did take a few pottery lessons um, in order really as to to inform my research for this book because in order to write about pottery I wanted to understand the processes and the best way to understand is to try it yourself. So I took a few lessons with one of the potters in Tunis. And after like five or six lessons I had made uh, one plate, one small bowl, one mug. Nice enough. But you know that was just the very beginning, and you really need you know these guys. They be, they were trained for like five six years in pottery to get to where they are. If I wanted to do that, I would have to be really committed to you know spend <laughs> the next few years of my life. But some people have done that. You know, like I was saying at the end there, Heather Henley, she was um, <clears throat> an artist, a painter, who came to the village and not had not done any pottery before. So she really spent time learning how to make pottery and to do what she wanted to do with, with her pottery. So people can do it, certainly. I haven't done that and I don't have the time maybe. And <laughs> I have too many other things to think about, but thank you. It, it seems from, from your presentation, I, I wasn't aware how physical it is to be a potter. I mean, not just the climate and the heat, and but I mean, it, it's it's really physical, isn't it? It's very demanding, it must be exhausting. Yes, and um, yeah, they, 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 they need a lot of uh, arm strength. You know, the, the, the manipulation of the, the clay, when I was <laughs> taking my few lessons, they were saying, like, take this gigantic lump of clay and, and knead it. And so to knead it, you know, I used to knead bread, <coughs> to make bread and this, that was easy compared to clay. It's not easy. You need a lot of strength. You've got to put a lot into it. Definitely, not easy. Any more questions? Thank you, Neil, for this uh, great uh, presentation and for this great book. I'd like to ask uh, you about uh, Neil Heisman, the author of the book, about you and the relationship and the, the, love, the, the love story between me and you. Really, I'd like to know when this uh, story, uh, when did this story begin and how and why for you because when I joined the UCI, I found out that uh, Neil uh, wrote about the young, the young guy, and the young, the young daughter. Please, uh, can you shed light on, in brief, the uh, love story between you and the youth? My love story with the you right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sandra. It, uh, well, it's all um, <coughs> coincidental and accidental. I, I came to Egypt in the first place as a volunteer English teacher. I, I volunteered to teach English anywhere in the world. The organization that sent me chose to send me to Egypt, and they chose to send me to Fayoum. I had no choice in, in the matter. Um, and as it turned out, it was a uh, fortuitous choice. I, I was very glad to be sent to Fayoum. That's how I ended up teaching for three years in Fayoum Faculty of Education. And so it started from there. And basically I stayed on. I moved to Cairo and worked here with you and with the press and so on for many years but I always kept the connection with Fayoum and, and going back there. But yeah, the start of it was by pure accident. One more question, last one, to wrap up. 
Okay, I think we could have uh, very casual conversations afterwards with Neil, but I just want to take the, the chance to thank everyone for joining us and Neil for this lovely presentation. Thank you, um, thank you. Thank being you passionate about Fayoum and uh, its <laughs> arts, we're very lucky, and we're lucky that you were sent to, to Fayoum, I guess. And if you would like, you could buy your copy of the book. It's available at the bookstore, and you can have it signed if you would be. <laughs> okay, but also we would like to invite you for uh, a reception, a small reception outside in Paris. It's a beautiful weather today, so enjoy and mingle. Okay, thank you everyone.